bom dia a todas e todos. É que a gente está recebendo hoje no Simpósio Internacional Segurança, Espaço Público, Desigualdade e Cidadania, Olhares Comparados, Brasil e África do Sul. A professora Julia Hornberger, da Wits University, é, a quem agradeço muitíssimo. E nós vamos, na sequência, a nossa atividade, agora pela manhã, com uma conferência da professora, essa conferência ela vai ser comentada pelo nosso colega coordenador do nosso Instituto Nacional de Ciência e Tecnologia, o professor Roberto Cândido de Lima, como também pela nossa colega pesquisadora Elizabeth Albernais, que fez o um trabalho na África do Sul com a professora Julia Hornberg, que é a co-orientadora né, da Elizabeth Albernais na universidade citada. E, na sequência, a gente vai abrir para o público presente, aqui no estúdio do Laboratório de Estudos Multimídia, do INEAC, e também para aqueles que, porventura, queiram fazer perguntas pela internet, mandando para o nosso site. É, eu queria agradecer muitíssimo a todos do nosso INCT, né, que promove esse evento, o Instituto Nacional de Tecnologia em estudos comparados de administração de conflitos. Quero também agradecer ao Instituto Nacional, ao Instituto de Estudos Comparados de Administração de Conflitos da UF, que também está co promovendo essa atividade, bem como os membros do Laboratório de Estudos em Conflitos da Análise de Segurança Pública, coordenada por mim, que está organizando esse evento. Muito obrigado a todos. Obrigado a quem está acompanhando de casa o nosso evento. E, sem mais delongas, eu vou passar a palavra à professora Julia Hornberger, que vai fazer uma apresentação cujo título é Flowers Accountability, Partisan Policing and Its Possibilities and Failures. É, nós não vamos ter é, tradução simultânea. Futuramente, é, vai ficar no, no, depositado né, no nosso canal a palestra, e aí sim a gente vai ter a possibilidade de colocar subtítulos, né? mas agradeço muitíssimo a todos que estão presentes, como também o acompanhamento. Professor, thank you, thank you so much. <laughs> Good luck. You. I'm going to take mine. Yeah. Okay. É, eu vou sair, certo? Deixar a professora tranquila e na sequência depois o professor Roberto Cândido Lima e Elizabeth Bernais irão é, participar da mesa para os comentários. Muito obrigado. All right. Um, before I start, I really want to thank Bete or Beche. I learned now how you pronounce it in South Africa. We she's always been called Bete, uh, Lenin and Roberto for bringing me here. This has really been uh, a long-awaited possibility. Uh, when Beche contacted me some time ago, it must have been one and a half years or even two years ago, if we could host her for comparative research around policing and urban security in South Africa, I was immediately very enthusiastic. I had been thinking for long that we need more comparative research between South Africa and Brazil because they, in one way, so similar and yet so different. And it provides a different foil to see what's really going on in the field of security rather than your, you know, old, and not very fruitful north-south comparison, these kind of comparison between two major countries which struggle with huge issues around policing is something which I've been looking forward for a long time. So I think we really hit it off. It was very productive, but I also hope that this is only just the beginning of something which can we can <laughs> build on, which can be expanded, and which can produce a much more intense dialogue between our institutions. So thank you so much for bringing me here. It's really wonderful. Um, I have to admit that I struggled for quite a while to decide on what I would talk here today. 
the looming political developments in Brazil, of which we receive plenty news in South Africa, and I think as Betje knows, South Africans care a lot about what goes on in Brazil. There is a sort of kind of fraternity there looking to the other side. Um, made it very hard to think of what could possibly meet the seriousness of what is going to happen once Bolsonaro would be elected. And especially with regard to policing, the overpowering threat of that and already existing reality of summary and extrajudicial killings could even more be made legal with a government explicitly supporting torture and the killing of other thinking people and the poor who dare to stand up and speak up instead of submitting to their destruction. Such a looming threat of change and crisis tends to, however, silence any more subtle analytical impulse. It also skews the comparison with South Africa, as if in comparison South African police starts to look good and benign, which they not. And something I would like to be, uh, and it's really not what I would like to be the effect of a comparison. Too much is amiss in South Africa, and yet at this moment it does not match up. Isn't that strange that that's what we get when we compare different forms of suffering and violence? But maybe they should not even become commensurable and as such comparable in the first place. But somehow our tendency is to arrange things in a hierarchy, in this case a hierarchy of violence and atrocities, even if the difference is not one of degree, but how have they become embedded, structural, habitual, visible or invisible? But when drama hits, subtlety, subtleties go first. Subtleties are the first casualty. Subtleties do not fit the sense of time, the sense of historical time, because when what we seem to experience is a time of tectonic shifts, of continents moving, right? Subtlety might even seem frivolous. <coughs> if right and wrong, good and bad, life and death are at stake, who can haggle over the analytical meaning of details in such times? Isn't it clear what's going on? Isn't it all too clear? So that really made it hard for me to think about what to present here today. And so when I th thought about this, um, I thought, so what I then thought was to resist the impulse of letting go of subtlety, which I think can also be a gesture of resistance, to not be swept away or swept up in what others impose on us, to not be just reactive, to simply react to a crisis, even though if it seems to pervade every last corner of our lives and occupies our entire thinking. It's important here, I would like to suggest, that now not, not to throw fine-grained thinking overboard, even if we know that these more fine-grained arguments will not easily be heard and potentially even misread or misconstructed. It is therefore that I want to present some thoughts here which are not necessarily part of crisis, but emerge from a time in which democracy seemed possible. These thoughts are about police taking sides, choosing to act in the interest of a certain group, what we in South Africa call partisan policing. And I want to propose here how this in some way can be a form of accountability, as, as controversial as it is. And how in fact communi po community policing is exactly that, a form of partisan policing, at least when we take it serious in all its consequences and not simply as a rubber stamp of civilian police reform. And how this form of partisan policing does things which are better than we thought, even if they twist things, if they skew things. Um, I will present my thoughts here in four steps. I will go back into the history of policing and how the police played a major role in fostering dominance of racial capitalism. This might be of interest to you here in a comparative way of how another settler colony has organized policing. But my main point is to show what a mess partisan policing is, and in how it is actually not an easy form of policing to embrace. Yet, I'm doing th this to show that we, there is something there to salvage. Uh, the second step is to then give an example of a group of Pentecostal disciples who take the police to task through community policing and become themselves police, 
claiming both to make the law and to claim certain territory. This is to show that there is such a thing as partisan policing from below, right? I then show how a partisan policing from below can take, sh can take sh shape through what we generally would call corruption. But I think as we all know, corruption is a very loaded word and it often more serves to point fingers at others than a description of a necessary social situation. And so I'm not really discussing corruption here in this context, but I think the word pops into mind if you hear the case study. It is about the interaction of the police and some of the poorest people in town, but how exactly this kind of appropriation of the police can produce some sense of security for the poorest of the poor. How then partisan policing from below is not necessarily a bad thing. And then I want to end with a rather whimsical episode of policing scandal, and that's when you get the video, where some youngsters were brought to their school prom, you know, the prom, the final school dance, with police vans <coughs> and a guard of honor. Ideally, I show you the video which went viral, which has brought about a huge outcry of what the police should not be doing. Yet, in contrast to this common sentiment, I would like to argue that this whimsical police employment actually has some utopian element in it. An utopia which could be strayed from a genre which is very hotly debated in South Africa, which is called Afrofuturism, and its way of imagining a society of freedom free of racial discrimination. So that will be kind of, this is the map of my talk. Um, but before we board the time machine to fly into an utopian futuristic other world, Let's travel back to the very beginning of the South African police in the 19th century. This, in a way, is a long history, the long durée of partisan policing. From the inception of the police in the 19th century, one of the primary roles of the police in South Africa, mounted on horses and paramilitary attire, was not to keep peace among people, but to police territory and to suppress internal resistance to colonial rule. These colonial regiments, at least in the British territories of Natal and Cape, so they were, South Africa at the time was like four different colonies called the Natal, Cape, Transvaal, and Free State, of which two were firmly in British hand, the other more in the, what we know as Afrikaans or Boer population followed the example of the Royal Irish Constabulary, which had a long history and proven record of suppressing civil unrest and political agitation. Because in Britain, so Ireland in a way was the first colony for the British. Anyway, prior to, prior to the Union in 19, 1910, that was after the Boer War between, um, so in South Africa, you always have to remember there was like a major split between a so-called Afrikaans-speaking population and a Br British population. So it's not just all between black and white, but there was a lot of white on white tension, which, without which you can actually not understand even the emergence of apartheid. So there was a big, there was a war between the British and the Afrikaner, and in 1910, uh, or uh, so the British, the, the Union of South Africa was founded, which was kind of a peace treaty between these kind of various groups. Um, there was also no single police force at the time. Mounted regiments were complemented with potpourri of other police forces, such as the special force for specific forms of infrastructure, which were key for the industrial development of the country, mainly mining, gold and diamond mining railway police, private police for the mines, native administration, so this is the people who, this is about the people who governed the black population, and town police. Each of the four colonies had one such set of multiple police forces. But even where there was a potentially more civic town police, like the one set up in Johannesburg at the turn of the previous century, and would supposedly subscribe to a more civilian outlook, Police officers were placed in the service of mining industry to forcefully manage their workforce. So three laws deserve special attention here. That was called the liquor laws, the pass laws, and the gold laws. These were laws which kind of really, um, together their enforcement led to in the incarceration of an otherwise innocent bla black population, which led to a criminalization and a dehumanization 
whose effect is until today at the core of South Africa's reproduction of inequality. So I can't go into detail with each of these laws, but past laws, for example, was uh, as a black man, you could only come into the city if you had a job. And you couldn't settle there because you would have to leave the moment your contract ends. So you had a lot of people who came to look for work to Johannesburg, but they didn't actually have the passes yet. So they were simply looking for work, and that in itself already made them illegal in the city, right? So you had people seeking work. They were like trying, uh, liquor laws were similar. It was simply about kind of uh, various taverns which were established around the mines and people frequenting them would have been criminalized. So it wasn't, it was very clearly non-criminal activities which were turned into criminal activities and that led to mass incarceration. So that is really very deeply uh, at, the bot or at the core of uh, South African society and is an effect which carries on until today. With the forging of the Union in 1910, the plan was to have a highly centralized single police force. At least that was the fantasy of the newly appointed commissioner and people close to him who had the modernization of the police at heart. Trutter, oh, that was the name of the commissioner, succeeded in centralizing the force with the control located firmly in Pretoria. However, the second p aspect of the plan, to have only a single police force, was thwarted by the government, especially the Ministry of Justice, which insisted on keeping a dual system, the South African police for the growing cities and the South African mounted riflemen for the rural areas and countrysides uh, in order to control any resistance to white rule by black people. To leave no doubt about the role and methods of this, these riflemen, it were their law was the existence was promulgated under the Defense Act of 1912 and not the Police Act. So there was clearly uh, the military bias there. The riflemen were finally absorbed into South African police service after World War II. By then, however, unrest by any event had become the phenomenon of the urban areas rather than the rural areas because of major urbanization. And the South African police had already taken over many internal security tasks, such as the quelling of protests and strikes. In fact, from its inception in 1913, the South African police was fully absorbed in such tasks. Just consider a year like 1914, in which the South African police firstly helped to suppress a w railway strike, which turned into a general strike by white workers and was swiftly crushed by the police and the military, acting with powers under martial law, in the same year, the police were involved in suppressing the so-called De La Rey Rebellion, which was a rebellion by Africana uh, rebels. And finally, the police helped with the conquest of German Southwest Africa, which is now Namibia. On the side of the police, this drove a process of militarization with a tendency towards drill and weapon training and the introduction of military ranks. By 1922, it had even become thinkable to use the police in combination with air force bombing to end a strike by white workers. Still the number of people killed in those interventions pale in comparison of how the police dealt with black resistance. In 1920, the police led by the commissioner himself killed 200 black people in an uprising in Bullhook, which is a famous kind of moment of resistance but a squashed resistance. Meanwhile, where the police were trying to deal with so-called ordinary crimes that threatened white people, and here it was really around the white living areas of the city, people's lives and property in the growing industrializing cities at the beginning of the 20th century and which were rife in Johannesburg especially, they were deeply caught up in inefficiency. This was shaped especially by corrupt entanglements with the various gangs who were attracted by the unruly, male-dominated, precious metal business of early Johannesburg and its gold mining. Also, the main effort of the criminal investigation department, so the detective service, were still focused on disciplining a mining workforce and the enforcement of the, as I already mentioned, gold, liquor, and pass laws. 
And yet police management tried to maintain a language of modernization and aspiration towards professionalism and independence by trying to secure better educated recruits, by insisting on a civil police spirit through technological advances in the field of forensics, and by maintaining a principle of minimum use of force. Still, these more civilian efforts remained a form of window dressing but otherwise fail to fundamentally undercut the central political role police played in serving major industrial interest and the white elite. And even where white middle class citizens who might have had some influence on what kind of policing they wanted expressed their unease about armed police officers patrolling <laughs> in the area, such liberal concerns were quickly overruled with a consensus of these very same citizens when confronted with a growing black urban under and working class. So the structural constellation of bias towards crowd control in its more exceptional form mainly directed at white, white industrial action and Africana rebellion and in its mundane form directed at the disciplining and keeping in check the black working force was at the root of the South African police from its inception. It reproduced itself over the years in different variation, strengths, and proportion. During the late phase of apartheid, when protests erupted in many of the townships, the government responded even more with militarizing the police. At the same time, they reduced their capacity to respond to ordinary crime. As a consequence, townships became lawless areas where gangs and other strongmen ruled <coughs> through vigilant justice. What we then have at the end of apartheid is a police which had always been partisan towards the political by then Africana elite and the white population which they represented and most importantly enabling economic foundation of the country built on racial capitalism and a cheap black labor force. It is clear where the idea of partisan policing gets a bad reputation from and why it might seem ludicrous to even try to recover anything interesting about it. Clearly also then, all this was to change when the new government led by the African National Congress and its president Nelson Mandela took power. Political and economic bias were to be dismantled and instead the police was to serve everybody equally, especially for areas like the townships where the majority of the population was black. This was to mean that they were now also entitled to the protection by the police making the area safer instead of just being the target of police harassment. One of the ways in which this was to be implemented was through so-called community policing, a term I'm sure everybody here is familiar with, as it represented one of the most globalized efforts of the post-90s period of bringing about a more democratic police across the world, from Indonesia to Brazil, from Eastern Europe to South Africa. Everybody had to kind of implement community policing. I've written quite a lot about community policing, but mainly in a highly critical vein about how it has been a, a failing. The line of my critique has always been that it could not remain true to its claim to bring police closer to the population as a whole. Instead, it seemed it was always a certain powerful local group which took charge of what in South Africa is called community policing forums where police and community meet and where policing priorities for the local area are being decided. This then could be called partisan policing from below. But as I said, I was originally I was very critical of this. One of the examples where I describe how community per definition produces partisan policing from below is in a chapter called Policing Against Evil. Here I describe how the local branch of, religious of a religious Pentecostal church uses community policing to establish both a spiritual and territorial hold over the policing area within which they operate. Their practice to do so, or their practices to do so, have many sides to it. The main thing is that they become part of the community policing forum the forum, as already explained, where community and police officers are supposed to meet to discuss common strategies, where they would point police into directions of where to carry out their raids. They list what they call spots of vice, such, an, 
such as informal drinking spots, for example, and they make sure that on the day of the raid, uh, they direct the police towards it. They also would put on T-shirts T-shirts which says community policing forum and use this as a kind of a uniform which gives them an authority to knock at people's doors and request entrance. Once in the houses, they talk to people not so much about public safety but about the Lord and how they should respect the rules of the Lord. At the same time, they carry out prayer sessions for police officers at the station and they cook lunch for them. Through these acts of friendliness towards the police, the police don't mind their interference too much. At the same time, many people accept their authority as they have the backing of the police. It is, however, a mixed area and not everybody in the area is a Pentecostal believer. In fact, there are many Muslims living in the area who in principle then through these interventions are hugely alienating from police protection. That was then also my main point, why I argued in the article or in the chapter that community policing does not work. But recently I've been rethinking my critical stance on this form of community policing and its supposed failure. And I'm not no longer so sure. I realized that my critique was based on an idea, idea and an ideal of democracy, which instead of becoming ever more possible is actually rather slipping away. So I, might be t so I was thinking that it might be time to actually rather hold on to what we have gained and to look at how things are rather than, than they should be. And what can we do with what we have rather than to allow it to be swept away entirely in the way for a return to authoritarianism? My revised point then, and I'm you know, I think that's an important thing that you're allowed to kind of develop your ideas as you, you know, do your research over many years to also see it from different perspectives as time changes. My revised point then is that I think that community policing is still bringing about a better form of policing than the one which retreats behind impersonal technicalities of the rule of law or a chain of command which is rooted somewhere else completely. So here then an example of the kind of most bottom-up form of partisan policing I have come across during my long-term ethnographic research with the police. I have coined it in my book, uh, My Police, Your Police, or uh, more conventional, I the informal privatization of police. There is nothing necessarily democratic about it. In fact, it is a form of policing which some would describe as corrupt. But what is interesting here is that it is a form of appropriating the police from below and which channels police protection to places of highest insecurity and precarity. I have called it my police, your police after the incident at which I first came to think about it in this way. I was working with the local police of the inner city of Johannesburg, a dense but poor area of Johannesburg, which is also where a lot of migrants from other African countries end up. It is an area of many high-rise buildings which once were the pride of middle-class Johannesburg people representing true modern living in spacious apartments. These apartments are now being subdivided and house about four to five families at the time. In a way, they are new vertical townships. Here, a single woman, so this is really the kind of ethnographic um, narrative, here a single woman had gone to the police station because other people in her flat, a husband and a wife, were trying to take away her living space. So they were trying to bully her out. To the police, however, she hadn't mentioned the housing conflict, but simply mentioned that she had been threatened with a gun. The police officers, not necessarily interested in her, but always eager to recover a gun, as one of the best ways to link somebody to a murder, came along with her. Back in the flat, back in the apartment, the wife, which tried to claim the single woman's living space, was obviously shocked that she had succeeded to bring in police to her for her help. The police then also quickly found the gun and arrested the husband. But defiantly, the wife shouted, you have your police, I will bring my police. 
And indeed, it turned out that she had a good personal relationship to a police officer with whom she was friends and who she and her husband had regularly provided with food and some clothes. In the end, it became a battle of whose, whose police was stronger. And indeed, the husband walked free, but he and his wife never dared again to invade the woman's living space. So in a roundabout way, a social housing conflict had been resolved. It is this kind of appropriation of police officers and directing them towards conflicts that are at the heart of people's everyday living, which is the potential of this kind of policing. The rule of law would have not helped either of them, as a housing dispute would not have been necessarily the prerogative of the police, and the husband would have probably ended up behind bars for a long time until his case could have been proven. But it was friendship with a police officer which brought about my police and the clever misrepresentation of the case <coughs> which brought about your police. This allowed the people to direct the police in a direction which made sense within their context of living. They were too poor to have their own private security to give them the protection they needed. But they appropriated the police in such a way that the conflict over highly contested living conditions was at least momentarily stabilized. Here then, highly partisan policing from below brought about a helpful resolution to a very insecure context. Okay, to end my account, on a partly whimsical but also serious note, I would like to show you a very recent video which went viral in South Africa a few weeks ago. To be honest, I found it quite hilarious which is not what these police videos which go viral normally are. Normally, they burst with some form of spectacular violence. But what this one, entitled Sirens, Smoke and a Riot Van, shows is the following. A local police officer, probably of some, high rank at his, uh, some higher rank at his local police station, at the occasion of his daughter's and the daughter's boyfriend prom, uh, meaning the end of school dance event, mobilized the station's armored vehicle and a bunch of police officers in riot uniform to escort the youngsters to the dance event. Dramatically, you will see, an officer releases green smoke as a prelude to the couples exiting the vehicle. The crowd screams in adoration with others snapping pictures. Dressed in red and gold and black, the couple then appears amid the plume of smoke pausing for the pictures alongside their police escort. Forming a guard around them, the police walk the couple down the runway. So let's have a look at it. that you're so beautiful. <laughs> triggered a round of enraged outcries in South Africa. People called for arrest and suspension of those involved. The commander of the province promised an investigation into the matter and that people would be held to account. He states what seems to be an obvious fact, that this was not in the line with the code of conduct of the police and resources could have been put to better use. But is this really so? I find the incident actually quite marvelous. 
and taking serious the enthusiasm of the crowd and the cheering going on, I couldn't imagine any other remotely similar intervention which would endear the police more to the people than this benign act of partisan policing. In fact, so I would like to argue here, there is something utopian about this moment. What it evokes is the possibility of a different world altogether. Imagine a world in which we wouldn't, would not need the police and its armored vehicles anymore, where crowd control and shields and batons and police tanks would have become obsolete in terms of disciplining the poor because there is no more inequality to be policed. But instead, police equipment is used to celebrate the moment of when people's children finish school by glamorously and dramatically setting it into scene. And indeed, what deserves more to be celebrated than such an educational milestone. It is a particular form of cultural expression called Afrofuturism, in which I find some conceptual backing for such a reading of the video. <laughs> Many of you might know what I'm talking about. Think the movie Black Panther, which represents a kind of commercialized version of what is considered to be Afrofuturism, a proud black African culture set in a techno science fiction world. For those of you who are wondering where the hell I'm going with this, let me explain. Afrofuturism is a genre of cultural expression, music, film, digital art, writing, which assumes that in this world as it is, there is no solution to resolving the negative cycle around black identity with a history which is over and over again reproduces disadvantage and discrimination. A history which catches up before it has even arrived. How then, so the argument goes, can we or they, I should probably say, because I don't want to assume, even imagine a better future without such discrimination and ever repeating histories of structural vi violence for black people? The answer is, in terms of Afrofuturism, by producing a radical break with a history, a discontinuity with a here and now, and to place the future into another imagined world, and where then the full autonomy can unfold. What this video then does, in that reading, it is to enact an Afrofuturistic other world, enacted with the technological props of the police, put to playful use, together with a dramatic appearance out of nowhere as the green smoke <coughs> resides, evoking indeed otherworldly sci-fi worlds of an unreal reality. So I think instead of being outraged about this inappropriate intervention by the police, which in its own way, by the way, makes reference to an unreal world, the outrage, right? Namely that police resources are employed in an entirely worthwhile manner or can be employed in a worthwhile manner and lead to the direct reduction of crime. So that's a fantasy on its own anyway. So instead, so I'm arguing here, people should embrace the utopian vision which is enacted in this video. And they should have as the potential of the kind of partisan policing which emerges from below and which this video represents. The outcome might be chaotic, especially in its radical plurality, so everybody kind of like employing the police for their own ends, but it would definitely not serve one dominant group alone and protect elites' interest from afar. I think as things are closing up, we should take serious the subtle maneuvers which are already exist in an embedded form and which are carried out by people themselves and try to think in unreal ways about them. We need to keep open the aporia of hope. Thank you. Well, thank you, Julia, most of all, for coming here and to give us that amazing lecture for us, the conference. Um, now we are going to start like the, the debate and thank all everyone that's here present. Thank you very much, professors and the students. Um, and we're going to start with
Professor Kant making his comments, and then I'm going to comment about your presentation too, like mm -hmm. establishing parallels between the Brazilian situation and South African situation, okay? So, thank you. Uh, thank you, and uh, well, I'd like to thank uh, very much to Julia to for being here with us, and I also would like to thank uh, Betsy and uh, Lenny for providing us with this opportunity. Uh, this is, um, we are in a very difficult moment in our country right now in respect to what uh, uh, we think about public security and the police role. And uh, because the, uh, the situation that uh, probably is going to happen in the next uh, four years is very, you know, seems to be very different from what we actually uh, think that the police should be doing. Uh, and, um, and this is a, a, a very special reason for having you here and also for having uh, opportunity of cooperation with, your, with yourself and with your institution. And uh, I am very, uh, very, uh, I hope that this will happen in a very nice uh, uh, a way. Uh, I see that you have a, a book here and, uh, and probably we could maybe uh, make some arrangements for translating it into Portuguese, for instance, if you would like to. And, um, and I, I would also uh, like to invite you to publish your article in our journals. We have a journal in anthropology, uh, which is called Antropolitica. Anthropo and uh, also we have other journals uh, in um, specialized in public security in the discussion of uh, conflict administration and things like that in, uh, uh, with our friend uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, partner, uh, Professor Michel Missy from uh, uh, the Rio de Janeiro uh, Federal University, which is the, the Rio de Janeiro City Federal University, one of them. <coughs> so I, I uh, uh, saying so, I, I pass my, the word to my uh, colleague, Elizabeth. Well, thank you, Professor Kant. And well, uh, Julian, um, it's a pleasure to listen to you always. Uh, I read your, your articles that you wrote about uh, this thing of partisan police. Mm -hmm. And like I was preparing like some parallels that I think they are interest to, to establish with Brazil. That one thing that called my attention very much when I was in South Africa, it was something that, that for because you were talking about controlling the police at certain point. Like people are always trying to appropriate police power and to use and to like their interest and their their focus, what they are mm. yeah. So, but what called my attention in South Africa was that people were very, it's, it's a kind of, Professor Kant can help me with that, but it's a kind of colonial common law in, in South Africa. So people, at the same time that people value a lot this pact, so they are interested in controlling the police. That's why they like, for example, they, are inter they, they embrace so much the public, uh, the the sorry the um, private safety uh, industry in South Africa like for once I told that story yesterday uh, I was talking to a friend and he was in and he lives in a white suburb it's not a white suburb anymore because it's not restricted to whites anymore but it's very white and it's a suburb and it's in the north and where where rich people lives so I, don't know, I was telling him that. Well, that this police is going to do. They are going to approach me and frisk me. No, they are not police. They are public. S they are. They are private safety. They are, uh, they can do that. Where is written with, with this law thing that, that we have? Like, what is written? What's the mandate? No, they can do this. And he looked at me like s it sounded weird, awkward to him. And he said, "I don't mind what is written. What is law? What's." 
I don't mind. At, at, as, wha- as far as they are doing what we think it's important to us, what they should be looking for, I don't care what is written. And we here in Brazil, we have this obsession with the state and with the law. So we, we are always asking for more state to solve that. Uh, because we also see this, yesterday I was uh, talking about this, like new forms of segregation in South Africa and safety and risk. It's very, it's a new way to segregate on the post apartheid. Who can pay for the police, who cannot pay, but they are not interested in the police. In the, they're not interested in more police, but here, when we try to, when we do, when we do community police and participation, we try to, th- we are asking always for more police and more laws and heavy, we are worried about that. In South Africa, I think, I th- saw people interested in having control on their ways of producing protection. So in the, in the suburbs, you have the, the this, like, huge because the industry of of industry of uh, private s- security in South Africa is huge so in the suburbs you have this private security so you establish with it's a contract so you establish with those guys like what you think it's a priority and what kind of community you want to preserve and when you go to like a colored suburbs you have neighborhood watch and the police is just a certifier of that you know, of the this form, the, your militia. I want my own militia, and I want the state to certify my own militia. So you just form your 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 neighborhood watch, and you go to your local prison, and you you ask for, for permission, and they recognize your your little militia, and you can take care of your own neighbor because you're colored, you're interested on, your colored things, and you want this police to pay attention to that to what you are interested on and what you are worried about. And in the townships, like you, you barely have police. Like in Alexander, there were two police <laughs> officers in Alexander. It was, and the rest was in Alexander, sorry, is a township in the peri-urban area of Johannesburg, which the metropolitan region of Johannesburg. And a township, for the, those that doesn't know, different. F- it's like the favelas here, but the difference is that it was made by the state. Like the favela, is a, it's faced like a, a disorder of the urban space, and it's spontaneous. The state has a big role in producing the favelas, but they don't do it by law. Like in South Africa, you do it by law. You used to do it. You used to do it by law. So you, oh, we black people can live in the city? Okay, but they have to work in the city. So you have to build a place for them to stay uh, in the outskirts of the city and to work, to be near, like the as a working labor, nah, to work at the city. So you create the townships. So the government build the houses, build the things, everything, the infrastructure, and transfer people from township to township uh, according to the demand of the market. So they were the the like we need a market uh, uh, labor here at Santon. So you create Alexandra to 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 uh, supply with with working force for the, the the suburbs. So at these places like the townships, the you have a lot of mob justice, like you like you said, like people take like their protection their by their own hands. So you have a lot of uh, uh, people got, uh, getting burned, beaten to death. Like there are many cases in the townships like that. So the people are like in South Africa, I felt man, my feeling like looking from Brazil that we are always, and you know that I, my part of my research was observing the, the, pu- the, s- the, the council, mm-hmm. the participation, the public safety, Conselho Comunitário de Segurança, Community Safety Council. Okay, that's. And uh, I observed the Community Safety Council, and we talked about that. So at the Community Safety Council, we are all, we the the civil society with all uh, the civil society demands more police. More. They are not interested exactly in controlling the police. 
They, and they don't control the police. The police are under the control of the own police. No one controls the police, <laughs> you know, because they are playing, they have institutional like interests here in Brazil. They are partisan. Mm. They have their own agenda. Nah? And they, like we saw, like the, with this election now, nah, we clearly had the police in the side of one ideal of society, not to say one specific mm -hmm. candidate. Nah? So uh, it, here in Brazil, we, we, we are always uh, demanding this, like more police, more laws, and, this, and at your, at, um, at South Africa, I saw it in a different way. Like this, do, do you do you do you recognize this somehow? So I would. You, I your turn. My turn. Okay. Yeah. So I think that's that's a interesting. So I think that's exactly the kind of comparison which then where I would think really is that so? And then it only makes sense in the access the excessive way in which it's demanded here. Because on the one hand, I would say people do call for more police. Mm -hmm. You know, in the kind of like obvious way, something happens, they say, oh, we don't have enough police officer, we need more police, we need more security. But the reality, I think you're absolutely right that in many ways people have given up on the police or they never expected it to function, right? Because they're coming from a long history, and that's what I explained before. Police was there to suppress. It was never there to police the townships for safety or for security, <laughs> right? So people have given up, and they have a long history of making do without the police. And in fact, I mean, that's going <coughs> to, you know, these structures of running the townships yourself took a long time to being dismantled, and they erupt any time there's a need for some kind of self-rule again, right? And it takes, and that's exactly why I think even when there's a police presence, and that's what I'm trying to describe also in my work, then it's not people think, oh, now we have the public police here, right? They say, oh, there is police. There's like, there's like force. There's uh, violence there. Let's do something with that, right? We're already doing our own thing. Let's pull in the police, mm -hmm. right? That's mm -hmm. why that... Uh, why there is such a strong way of appropriating the police into the kind of forms of justice or uh, I don't know even how to call it, right? Because it can actually just take the form of a prom um, and to pull the police in for that, right? So you use it. What's there, you use it. If it's police, if, it's, if you have the money, you use the private police. If you have political power, you use that. So people kind of appropriate wherever they can and it doesn't happen necessarily in the same way with confirming the power of the state it really confirms some form of local rule yeah yeah i i, I think so too uh and one other thing that called my attention always uh it's this idea like this um the situation that they are the, the police were used to bring people to the prom and that was a that was n like people the, the 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 heads of police like were thought that that was a misuse yeah. of police nah? and what uh, that that's a question that i made myself like at my thesis is like so what's the police is for nah? What they are, what they are guarding, what they are doing, if they are not doing like that, like not exactly the prom, but with their, if they are not paying attention to what people are really interested on, like what they are really feeling unsafe, nah? So what they are do that they do, nah? So it's another question is like what public safety, like here in Brazil, nah? Public safety does besides the public safety policy. It does more. It has its own politics. So if you are, if they are not doing this to people, what is the politics of the police? So what they supposed to be paying attention? Nah? it's it's one thing because it, the, here we have we have that. Um, uh, I try to find not very strong words, but it's like a, a farce mm -hmm. of participation. Mm -hmm. You know, actually, no one is controlling. Anyone and the police has its own agenda, mm -hmm. but you have those poli community police initiatives. You have this participation spaces, 
né? And how there, there are many. It's not a space here to, to talk about that. Actually, we can talk about that tomorrow because we have a board about it <laughs> to attend. But yeah, but in many ways, what is established? It's a dialogue with something that doesn't exist. With actually fear, with this civil society that it's actually uh, emancipated from the, the the life of the communities, and that they are captured by a certain civil society. Uh, we call uh, when we talk about participation, we talk about, we think that the other part is civil society, and but who is civil society? So that and who is the civil society that are in the the community the the Conselho Comunitário de Segurança Safe Community Safety Council? Who is the civil society that is at the community safe that sit there that can go there and they are they are allowed to speak and their demands are, are going to be heard and not criminalized, nah? But when you go there, you go and you say, "No, we are democratic." Because we we listen to the population, we have community councils. It's a well-established police since 1999 in Rio de Janeiro. So we do participation. We do. We, we are democratizing the police at the those spaces that we have this this like you are calling partisan, and you are assuming it's partisan because you come from South Africa. So you see this common this, this colonial common law, this demand for. Uh, but here, we don't see that. We see like th those spaces being appropriated by a certain civil society that play, and the police uh, uh, have strategies not to th to to make this participation fake. Like, uh, for example, uh, statistics. Nah? When you try to, when you demand the police, no, I'd like you to. I have a problem in my street. There are people smoking weed because there are always people smoking weed all around. And you, I want the police to come and to check. And the police officer can say to, you, to like the commander can can say to you, like, look, did you register this this at the? the did you did you make did you report that at the uh, the? No, I didn't. You don't think about how you don't trust the police, how you don't that you don't create an environment to receive this person. Why? How they feel stigmatized to go to a police station because you live in a favela or whatever, or you're gay or you're drag or whatever, nah? and you s just say like, "Did you go went to the the police station to report that crime?" No. They, oh, I'm, I'm so sorry. I can I can do anything for you because you didn't you didn't fulfill the report you know there are many ways to and not mentioning that in this those spaces you have uh, clearly like the, the police are being thrown mm -hmm. like thrown over a specific population and a sp specific places of the city with his full strength mm -hmm. like you are allowed to do things in those places that you're not allowed to do in not any other place mm -hmm. and we create that like with this the the fear and the the demand all of you are always demanding more state more state in those spaces like this the, the politics of public safety is making is exactly making more so what it makes it, the, what do you think? Like it expands the state somehow. Like not the po po because here in Rio de Janeiro, where the our elected president uh, had like sixty five percent of the the valid votes. So it's not for me. I don't know what you think. It's not a coincidence mm. that this uh, uh, the problem of public safety here in the Rio de Janeiro violence been this the spectacle of the gang violence of police v fighting the crime in the in the favelas and everything so this creates a kind of anxiety that assumes the language of violence and and but it's actually expanding the power th of the state over society so this is was not a coincidence that a guy like that our elected president, <laughs> like himself, <laughs> uh, they, uh, they, they, it, it, he found a, a space, like a, a environment that it's very 
receptive to the idea of an expanded state with more power and to intervene in the society. And we rely on that a lot to solve our problems. But you think about that. I'm so sorry if I, I talked a lot and then I... <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm like... <laughs> well, I, you know, I mean, public security in South Africa is a big... Um, it, it has a similar traction to be politicized, right? And to inflate people's fears into um, offering something which not necessarily, offering a f um, fantasy of security through, I don't know, like equally fantastic ideas of what the police can do, right? So the idea that security is an issue in the end for the police to resolve, I think that's the biggest problem, right? Because the insecurity doesn't lie. The, the police can do all kind of things, but it can't change the conditions which produce the insecurity, mm -hmm. right? So, but uh, it's it's a it's hysteria, right? So I think the the it's the it's what popula populism is about. You offering remedies, seemingly remedies for things which would require incredibly complicated political solutions. But, and people know, somewhere deep down, I believe people know that, how complicated things are and how irresolvable they are, unless something maybe such much more radical would happen. But nobody wants to go along with this kind of more radical solution. So what do we, what gets thrown at them is the, it's um, unresolved, like promises which can't be fulfilled. Right, and but they just they live in a constantly performative space in which the promises will be given over and over again without ever being uh, delivered. Right, and the violence which is being performed by the um, I assume by the Brazilian police is exactly c the performance of these promises, mm -hmm. but without any way of resolving what's at the root of these. Uh, what brings out the, the, the tension, which brings out the crime, which brings about the insecurity. So, you know, I think that's just, that's something we see everywhere. It's these, it's hysterical responses to very complex problems which people don't want to face. Uh, thank you. I think that I, uh, we should listen to questions from the, from yeah. our, Audience, okay, come come here, please. Uh, well, Professor Hohenberger, thanks for your conference. It's very enlightening, uh, and I really appreciated when you said that we must look for an utopian side of things. Well, I do not have any training in security studies, uh, but I do have some training in popular culture. And when you talked about this utopian side, I remembered immediately of Professor Joe Hernes uh, Fabian, who says that at the heart of the masses, uh, we find both horror and hope. We could say we find utopian elements and dystopian elements as well. So I would like you, I would propose you uh, to, to think a little more about this dialectics between utopia and dystopia uh, within the heart of the masses. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Julia, yeah. for your lecture. Uh, I, I would like to hear more about this uh, relation between society and law, because Beth, Beth told us uh, that uh, South Africans don't care about uh, written laws as we do in Brazil. So uh, I, I would like to hear more about that, this relationship between society and uh, written laws in South Africa. One more question. We would give a shot. We can help with the translation if that's the problem. It is not. Okay. Oh. Vocês gravaram isso? 
Não, então, gente, o problema, se o problema é a, tra a tradução, eu posso ajudar com a tradução. <risos> se for esse problema, né? Se não, a gente pode voltar para a mesa. Então, ok. Well, I have to... to they are not questions, but they are comments. Uh, the first thing is about community policing. Uh, because, as we know, uh, the concept of community in... in uh, 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 English sociology uh, mm. approaches uh, an idea of a, a, a reunion mm. of people, mm. of individual people. As I, I lived in the United States for a while, and mm. uh, they talk a lot about community, and the community is always uh, an association of people. And we have another idea of community that's a community is a given, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a given place, and whatever. And this makes a lot of differences. You are kind of uh, trying to intervene in or, or to have a dialogue with community because you have dialogue with individuals or you have a, a dialogue with the, the, the whole, uh, looking for the whole. And when you talk about community policing mm. uh, here in Brazil, you are always uh, thinking about these communities as they themselves say they are because they don't want to say that they are uh, uh, favelas mm. and they say they should they are the community, the community, the community as if they were uh, a whole mm -hmm. and uh, uh, there is no difference between them, there is no difference between the favelas, there is no difference that's right. and uh, as such uh, the, the police force is always trying to um, uh, order it according mm. to their own uh, rules mm -hmm. and not according to the favela rules because this place is, is represented as having no rules, mm -hmm. no proper rules at, uh, mm. uh, at all. And this is a, a very, uh, I think this, this concept uh, uh, needs a more uh, thought and more analysis uh, because people here talk about uh, policia comunitaria and you have the other concept of, of community policing, which is... Um, the other thing that I thought very interesting is that you described in your talk a uh, very long tradition of uh, military, mm. or militarization of police, and uh, in a colonial uh, uh, world, etc. And uh, it looks like the, the second part of your talk, and the, the, talk, the part we are discussing right now, it uh, doesn't seem very militarized. Mm. Right, no? And in Brazil, uh, on the contrary, uh, we have uh, this kind of a tradition. Our police uh, uh, is proud, are proud, our police are proud of being founded by the, the king, uh, the absolute king of Portugal when he came here. You know, they, they say they founded the, the, the military police and the, and the judiciary police and they are very proud of this, the, the story of police. Uh, uh, and, um, and the idea is very much like, uh, you, you know, they have the flag of the police, has the crown of the, of the king. Their academy is called uh, Academy Don João VI, which is the name of the king of Portugal, who came here in 1808, and uh, after that stayed here up to 1821, running f uh, <laughs> away from Napoleon, yeah. and, uh, and then he get back to Portugal, and uh, et cetera. Well, and this uh, association of the police with the state mm -hmm. is very strong, anyway. And, uh, and the, the idea also that we have uh, different uh, segments of society have unequal rights mm -hmm. uh, also prevents proposes the idea that uh, repression is the main uh, uh, way of, uh, of uh, ordering society because you can't have conflicts between people who have unequal rights. You know, it's a little bit like uh, South Africa in the yeah. sense that uh, conflicts between whites and, and, and blacks are not, uh, not to be treated uh, uh, with negotiation but with repression. Yeah. I mean, yeah. uh, to be a little bit like that. And our uh, empire in Brazil mm -hmm. in the 19th century, uh, let's say that reinforced this. But then we became a republic mm -hmm. 
and uh, this goes on, goes on and on, which is kind of kind of strange for uh, 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 if you look like a, a, a kind of a change in government should mm. change uh, also in, in, in the ordering of society mm. rather. So uh, my my and we became very military. And today we are barely militarized, not only the, the so-called military police, but also the judiciary police yeah. are all very militarized. Mm -hmm. And it looks like repression mm -hmm. is the only way of uh, maintaining order in society. Mm -hmm. So this, uh, these two things I'd like you to comment, if possible. Okay, <coughs> okay thank you for this great set of questions. Um, I'm going to start. So, so thank you for your question about the coming, thinking back to Fabian. And I think it's always been, so I think this has always been the privilege of being an anthropologist who looks at the police. You are allowed to think about it in a not, not, not instrumental way, right? So you are normally not involved in the business of reforming the police or making it better or introducing a kind of a, police course or police training and um, you know I would find it very hard so I kind of use the pr so I think there's a privilege as an anthropologist to think about police but it also the idea of opening it up in a different way to think about it you know not as this kind of eternal necessity for policing right so you I think there's a possibility to think and if you thinking about popular culture, it's it just a lot, you know, bringing this together, bringing the thinking about police together with other thoughts is actually very exciting, you know, and, but it makes you also redundantly useless, I think, for, you know, for your average um, police academy or something like that, because they don't, you know, they're about like recre uh, creating recruits and all that. So I really enjoyed that question because it's in the line of thinking which I'm trying to push with regard to the police, um, and which sometimes sounds flippant or frivolous or, you know, uh, beyond what I've actually what's needed, the, si the sincerity of the issue at stake. But you're bringing it back to a very serious issue, which is about the in at the heart of the, the populism from below always lies, like you say, the horror and the hope, right? And I think and it's really like, you know, for a very long time, I really looked at it in these, the, <coughs> the danger which comes from uh, uh, the, the putting the police in the hands of those who will reproduce a certain violence from below. And that is very much close to the idea of vigilant justice and the, the way vigilante works together with the police and in which, like you said, the police certifies certain kind of local activities of producing violence which then uh, actually terrorize and which are often very male dominated so it comes with a certain gender politics and that's always been my critique right so you give because people are as I said they take what they can take but it's always particular groups who will be at the front of taking those powers of the police and making them useful locally but I think there is, there is the other side to it. There is really, and the way people negotiate the police locally, uh, there's something to it which is also, and I will come to that, which brings me, which is somehow, it's not an even representation of community, but it at least anchors it locally, and it which means there is some certain kind of negotiation around it, as violent as it might be but it also means it's not in the hand of others outside of it. And I think that is, there is that moment of hope. And I think as we increase, as, as democratic values, liberal values are being so much discredited, right? And uh, of course there's an, an impulse to protect those, but I mean, maybe we must actually recover some of these liberal values in the making of the localities, you know, in the negotiations there, and that's, I think, but we know that the hope sits very close to the horror. And I think that's, you know, that's why it's so hard to even say that, right? As somebody who's, of course, wants a predictable police, of course, wants to be liberal values, uh, protections, predictability, limits of force and support in place, right? If I go to the police in South Africa, I don't want to negotiate 
my right to the police. I want to go there and say, I need to open this case. I need you to intervene, and I want it to function in that way, right? But that seems to be something receding so much at the horizon so we can run after it, or we can actually kind of see what's, what's there and which is there to be recovered. So maybe that in that popular version, in these fantasies, which are can really go, and I'm, I'm aware because when I had the video up here earlier, somebody said, this is the inauguration of the new president, right? <laughs> and here we have a prom. So maybe you can see how closely they are and they look the same, right? I mean, maybe this mirror is gonna put some green uh, fumes <laughs> up when he appears. <laughs> so I think, I think it's fascinating, you know, and it's it's very hard to make any, how can I say, political statements about it because you, before you know it, you're actually kind of supporting very authoritarian, very violent local practices, and that's not what I mean. But there is a, there is a token spirit sometimes there. Um, so society and law, so. So I wouldn't, so it's interesting to think that South Africans don't care about law because it's it's true and it's not true, but um, where, where is it? Yeah, ah, there, oh, behind, okay. <laughs> you know, we, we people, we had, uh, we had uh, at the end of apartheid with a new constitution. Um, so firstly, apartheid was fought through the law, right? So we have a lot of famous human rights lawyers who fought against apartheid from within the system, but by using the law in a very clever and powerful way. Nelson Mandela and stuff. Yeah, you know, like the, 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 but we have some really wonderful histories of human rights lawyers, and that history went into the making of the Constitution. And I would say the first 10 years after the end of apartheid, um, <laughs> was an obsession with the law and human rights, right? It was something, human rights was gonna do anything for everybody. And everybody was gonna take the issues to the Constitution. Even children said, I'm not gonna do the dishes, it's against my rights, you know? <laughs> so there was a very strong <laughs> sense <laughs> of what <coughs> rights could do for you. But that now, in the way, came with an incredible disillusionment because that hasn't materialized, right? And so if I teach a human rights class to my students, they they like, why are we learning this? You know, what is it gonna do for us? It's not gonna do it, right? So there's this disillusion with the rainbowism, there's the disillusion with the constitution, that romanticism has gone. But uh, South Africa is a relatively functioning state and a lot of things happen through a, of course, protracted bureaucratic process, but the law is there and I think people are especially poor people, what you find, I mean, we, this is, this is now very off, uh, off the police issues, but um, when you, when some, for poor people, if somebody dies, they have to go through so much bureaucracy and regulation to even re just recover the body, even if it's their husband, right? They can't just go and pick up a person from the mortuary. They have to, so there is a very strong sense of administrative law, which, uh, gets loose at the top and everybody can do what they want, but for poor people, it's, it's something of regulating them and holding them back and tying them down to an extent which, um, which yeah, which is actually, I mean, it's inhuman to a way, right? So I, I would, so I think there is a disillusionment with the kind of the questions of rights and protection but that doesn't go, that doesn't necessarily reflect how people's lives are entangled in incredible regulations, right? So, and some of it is also good because people get, I mean, South Africa has a functioning grant system. This is actually why I think we haven't seen a revolution because um, poor people get ch uh, child grants and pension grants. And that is being administered quite I mean, efficiently as far as it goes. but. It's everything is there, it's through the state, it's through a certain kind of administrative law. So I think administrative law is incredibly strong in people's lives. There's a disillusionment with human rights, which then maybe leads to this kind of flip, but let's do it different, right? Let's cut through, let's use violence to make, violence makes things possible, not rights, not the law. So there is that, but it's, 
it's a very, it's a, the state is everywhere, right? And so it's not in a very, I wouldn't say in a Foucauldian disciplinarian way, but there is some of that there in certain parts. So it would be wrong to say that the law isn't there it and it doesn't affect people. Yeah. Yeah. It, affects, so yeah. it affects people very strongly and they engage with it very strongly. But um, I think sometimes they just would like to throw it off. Um, okay, so this question about community is fascinating. I mean, uh, especially different um, conceptions of it. And so, I mean, I think the, what can I say? So if we, ha I think the police uses the idea of a community of individuals, which then follow individuals' rights and what they're supposed to do. It's, um, it's a way of actually getting rid of community policing, right? So if they actually take series of the self-representation of people in a particular community, <coughs> even if this community then is formed in a, not in an even rightful way, but in a hierarchical way, but me, be it that the drug lord is the boss of it, or is it a particular masculinity which leads it, but people's representation of that, uh, if they don't want to take it serious, they're not going to get anywhere with the people, right? I mean, I think that kind of tension of saying like, oh, you, you're, not, you're not a community because you are just the people forcing others to be part of the community is to misunderstand the kind of local rule which exists and which creates, I mean, I know from your work, at least momentarily, equilibriums, right? Moments of stability and yet, of course, they're undemocratic. But the idea that, uh, that to use democracy always as the critique of that, <coughs> if the democracy doesn't actually exist otherwise, is a very, it's a very backhanded way of not taking certain forms of leadership, certain forms of regulation serious. You know, and you, you're just breaking it down, not to make it more democratic, not to transform it into a different in that community of individuals of individual rights, but to actually kind of subjugate people, right? So I mean, that, I don't know if that speaks, but I think there's an interesting tension there in which, um, and uh, that speaks to like, to my partisan policing. So if you're taking series of how people represent themselves, you, you're in hot waters, right? Because you it might be, you kind of end up supporting certain kind of practices which you wouldn't support, <coughs> but if you actually want to engage with people, you need to t start with their representation of themselves. Um, otherwise, I think they're never going to trust you. So the, and finally, I think the, yeah, I mean, I think compared to the Brazilian military police, South African militarism is actually, light. it's light. Yeah, it's military <laughs> light. But there has been, so it's interesting that we had this wave of de democratization and, you know, the, the ranks were changed to civil ranks and everything military was taken away and then there was a nostalgia for that military feeling and the, they brought back the military ranks because it kind of was a sign of efficiency. You, uh, that was exactly the call for a stronger police and the police responded to it to bring back the colonel, to bring back the commander and all that. I don't know in how much that really changed. They also wanted this kind of internal discipline for the, the ethos for the police themselves because they felt they were getting lost in that kind of too civil thing. But the I it, so the policing has its rule in a kind of modern British police philosophy. And I think that is very, very historically very different from what, what Brazil has. <coughs> and um, as much as there has been crowd control, it's in the in the field of crowd control that, that militarization takes place. And we have seen an increase in protest in South Africa. And recently we had a huge protest of students uh, on campus and the police intervene. But, but um, I think the police are unaware in some way that they even function as a as a, as, a, as a military and have this effect of alienating people. So when S they sit in their hands, what's going on? Sorry, to? Julia, but I need to uh, communicate some, a problem for our community. And 
Why are I speaking in Portuguese? Roberto can translate for you. Pessoal, é o seguinte, acabei de receber a informação de que a Enel irá cortar a energia do nosso andar, porque supostamente há falta de pagamento por parte da universidade. Para, e estão nesse momento, eu tentei conversar com os técnicos da Enel, eles têm uma ordem de serviço e tal, 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 tal. Então, a qualquer momento, nós estaremos é, fora do ar, por conta teremos que... Não sei se vai chegar no elevador, né? Parece que é uma coisa realmente dirigida ao nosso instituto, ao nosso andar. Eu tenho muitas dúvidas com relação a esse tipo de coisa, porque a universidade ela é muito grande, ela faz pagamentos né, em toda a universidade, quer dizer, não, não pode ter um corte dirigido para uma unidade ou outra. Né? É, novos tempos, momentos né, que a gente tem que procurar resistir. E eu quero dizer para vocês o seguinte, essa atividade que nós estamos aqui hoje, com a professora Júlia Hornberg, é, é realmente o que nós vamos fazer do ponto de vista da resistência a esse obscurantismo que se coloca hoje sobre o Brasil, particularmente sobre as instituições, instituições de pesquisa de ensino superior. Né? Então, eu quero é, dar essa informação. Nós vamos continuar, mas em qualquer momento nós vamos sair do ar. Mas fica aqui né, a continuidade da nossa atividade com esse alerta, essa advertência. Eu vou continuar tentando resolver esse problema junto à reitoria, junto à Enel. Pode ser que eu não consiga. Mas eu quero deixar aqui esse protesto, né? e dizer que a gente vai continuar resistindo. <risos> Podem nos calar, mas não vão nos apagar, ok? Sorry, é, Julian, but it's very complicated. Deixa eu falar uma okay. coisa para você, por favor. É, não, eu ia perguntar se realmente cortar a luz do nosso andar, a outra atividade estava prevista para ser aqui ou para ser em outro lugar? Não, era para ser aqui e nós pois vamos é. ter que é, é. reorientar a nossa mesa para uma outra localidade. Isso. E aí nós vamos é, fazer a comunicação pelo site do INEAC, né, do nosso Instituto Nacional de Ciência e Tecnologia, pelo site da nossa unidade acadêmica e demais dispositivos comunicacionais. Valeu. Sorry, sorry. But... <risos> well, yeah, <it's>... New times. <risos> Very excited. I will, so I will continue try, so, <laughs> trying to uh, resolve the problem, okay? Yeah, sure. <laughs> okay. Well, so know. when is this going to happen? Uh, we don't know for sure. It might happen any time, but you can keep talking. Okay. Until <laughs> it happens. I don't even know where we were, but... Um, yeah. You, you know, yeah. It's misleading. The but you know, it's always... It's always um, absolutely... I was, um, I was going to say yeah. something, because uh, the militarization of police, uh, it's not only to have a military organization. The, the, the point is to see the police work as a fight, as a, as a, 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 a fighting or a war or something against crime or against uh, other people or whatever. And uh, what you described before was that uh, the police uh, in South Africa has been u have been used to uh, like a force, uh, a military force in this kind of combat, whatever. And uh, what uh, you are describing now is that it's not uh, anymore like that. I mean, it's despite the fact that this military organi organized, uh, and then and, and our problem here is not. Uh, because, for instance, the civil police are, uh, they are not militarily organized, mm -hmm. but they are, uh, they engage in a combat, in, in, in a fight with crime and with uh, people and whatever, with criminals and whatever. So that, that's, that, that's the, uh, the point. It's not only uh, the kind of uh, the face of the, the, the organization, but the... So I think in that way, I, I th that's why I was just coming to the recent experience of having the police on campus, and that was a sense of there was a you know students stood up with very uh, reasonable demands, and uh, 
which was about that the majority of them basically can't study because they can't afford it, right? So they, g they enter the university, they, um, uh, they get, but then they can't study because they have to sleep in the libraries, they don't have enough to eat. Uh, and so th there was a countrywide demonstration for what they called fees must fall so that uh, st uh, studying would be more affordable. And there, I think we saw a kind of intervention of the f police, which, you know, the police, even during apartheid, the police hadn't been allowed on campus because it was the prerogative of the, poli the university management to decide if police can come in or not, right? So they often, during apartheid, they actually kept the police out. And the irony was that during now height of democracy, the police was left was allowed to come onto campus, right? So there is, in a way, and it was brutal, and it was a cycle of violence, and, and students reacted to the police in all kind of, then increasing the violence on their side, and it escalated, and you know, it became all a finger pointing, who started the violence? Did the police start the violence, or did the uh, uh, students start the violence? And that basically divided even people on campus, but even the nation, and so forth. But in that way, it became warlike, it became uh, a suppression, a suppression of protest, it became, uh, and it was like, you know, your demands are not valid. And that is what we see everywhere, that we have a lot of protest because the, uh, the, the promises of the democracy are not materializing, and that kind of unrest is definitely the police has come in to suppress that un unrest. And it happens everywhere, in little townships, streets, highways are being blocked and that's where constantly the police then has this role to create a kind of stability in a world which is hugely unstable for the people involved yeah yeah sorry sorry this is so so i would say there's definitely a kind of you know i mean you can uh, how slow intensity war going on in a, in a kind of military role but it takes a form of a kind of using the civil police for that Thank you very much, Julia. Thank you very much, Professor Kant. Thank you all for coming, our professors, our colleagues, students. Uh, thanks for Lemmy for all the support, the live transmission, all the infrastructure we had to do that event this morning. I like to take our viewers, whatever you are, whatever you believe. We thank you very much for watching us. Julia, uh, in the name of our research group, our institute. We have a little gift for you. Okay. Seems surprised because you already know that I was giving it to you. <laughs> okay. But I see what it is now. Yeah, <laughs> and it's very good. You will enjoy. Yeah, we have a good sense. We have a good saying here in Brazil. Yeah. Like recently, it's more like accurate, more applied, because we say like, Brazil obligates me to drink sometimes. <laughs> and it does, and we are, just making it like real and giving you drinks because and cachaça like from <laughs> Minas, from Minas province. Pedro is from Minas. Yeah, it's from Pedro's land. Okay, okay? thank you very much, thank Julia. You. Thank you all. And we see in the afternoon if the light or whatever it is <laughs> lets us to come back. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>